pleased to be joined today by Dr. Dan Conroy Bean. He's a professor of psychology at the University of California, Santa Barbara, where he runs the Computational Mate Choice Lab. He's an expert on mating psychology. Dan, welcome to the Nature and Nurture podcast. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you. So mating psychology is a big term to unpack because it seems like there are many ways you could go about approaching it. There's like social media use and modern dating apps and mental health. There's like old school attachment theory. And then there's evolutionary theories of mating psychology, which is, I think, where your work falls in. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I tend to fall in that third camp. Could we talk about that? What it may be a broad overview to what evolutionary mating psychology looks like as a field? Sure, sure. So uh, an, evolution, an evolutionary approach to mating psychology is basically uh, the ambition is to uncover, uh, at least the way I see it, the ambition is to uncover uh, what are the specific computational mechanisms in between your ears that are responsible for all of your thoughts and feelings and behaviors in the mating domain. So who are you attracted to? Who do you pursue as a mate? Uh, how do you regulate your relationships once you start them? Uh, uh, uncovering all the psychology that's responsible for all of that is our aim. Uh, and we use evolutionary theory as a guide to make predictions about what that psychology is likely to be. So we turn to what we know about uh, the lifestyles of human ancestors throughout most of our evolutionary history, uh, what we know about the kinds of relationships they would have formed, and what we know about the kinds of problems that would have posed. Uh, and then we use an understanding of those problems to predict adaptations that would have been improbably good at solving those problems. And then we look for those mating adaptations in the lab. Is mating psychology in this sense limited to what people consciously recognize as it's towards mating? Or could you have also some very roundabout explanation of like, you know, let's say you get a job promotion and you're excited. And then the evolutionary psychologist might come along and say, you think you're excited about the job, but you're actually excited because the job raises your status and status <laughs> means more mating opportunity. Uh, well, you know, I think we have to be careful here. So yeah, certainly, no, we're not proposing that all of these things are, are uh, uh, conscious uh, or accessible to consciousness. Um, there are plenty of... Uh, there are plenty of things that happen outside of your conscious awareness, right? Uh, that are uh, psychological adaptations. That said, that doesn't. Uh, you say that, and people, yeah, often think that that means that you have some sort of like unconscious drive to like maximize your fitness or something. There's some little like right. hidden homunculus inside of you that is like trying to game out evolution, uh, and that's not really how it works either, right? There, there's no part of you that is really aware of fitness. There's no part of you, most likely the part of you that is really like trying to maximize your reproduction or something like that uh there's you you know you are just like your like physiological system to like all of your organs there's no like hidden organ that is like trying to maximize your reproduction all the time no you just have a collection mm -hmm. of organs each of which does a job that keeps you alive and it does that job because your ancestors who had that organ out reproduce those of them who didn't, right? Uh, and it's the same thing psychologically, right? You have a collection of psychological systems, some of which are accessible to consciousness, some of them aren't for reasons that are not entirely clear. Uh, and all of them just do a job in getting you through your social life, getting you through your, uh, uh, well, your physical life in many ways too. Um, and they exist because they contributed to reproduction in the past. And that doesn't mean that you have like a conscious or unconscious drive to reproduce. <laughs> Are you familiar with any of the, the research on serotonin and social status? Not much, no. Well, me neither, ask? but, but I'll, give, I'll give you the snippet <laughs> that stands out in yeah. my mind. So there are some studies that find that baseline serotonin levels, which are, are going to be related to like your overall mood and happiness, are related to where you fall or where you think you fall in the social ladder. So this applies to humans. And then in humans, it seems to be more about like perceptions because it, it's harder to like objectively quantify where what your what your social status is um, and then there's also other research in animals uh, especially animals that have like these dominance competitions um, e even going as far back as lobsters where if they get in a fight the winner will have elevated serotonin levels and the loser will have lower serotonin levels and if you give the loser SSRIs so antidepressants, mm -hmm. then it'll act like a top winning lobster. And the cool thing about that is it, it seems to be hinting at like some basic 
neurobiological mechanism for what um, what we were just talking about, like maybe some hidden homunculus that is in fact tracking social status. I mean, sure, yeah. I think there's lots of things that track sort of relevant variables about your social life, right? Status is a really important one across yeah, a wide range of species. And so we should probably expect relatively conserved species or relatively conserved systems that are uh, tracking whatever the equivalent of uh, status is in your species. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know, like, so conserved that the same system would be present across humans and lobsters, I'm not sure. Uh, that would be pretty ancient. But um, uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I think there are parts of you that are tracking sort of more abstract variables that ultimately are linked to reproductive success. It's just a question of, is there anything in you that's really uh -huh. tracking reproductive success directly? Uh, right. And like sort of tallying your evolutionary success relative to your peers, probably not. Uh huh. So, like, so is this related to that idea of like proximate versus ultimate evolutionary explanations? Like how you might say the evolu the ultimate explanation for a mother's love for her child is like, oh well, if you love them, then you're more likely to care for them, and they're more likely to survive and pass on your genes. But then, if you ask the mom, she's just like, no, I love my child because I love them. Exactly, exactly. That's uh, uh, um, uh, uh, exactly it. There's a, there's a great, um, when I teach this to my class, there's a great uh, William James quote when he talks about um, a mother hen sitting on her eggs and how, you know, to her an egg is the most precious, never to be too much sat upon object in the world. Mm -hmm. um, you know, yeah, a, a mother hen just finds eggs delightful to sit on and she doesn't necessarily have any awareness. He actually says this, but he, she doesn't necessarily have any, like, articulatable awareness that she likes to sit on eggs because it helps her offspring uh, develop. She just really, really enjoys sitting on eggs because uh, right. hen ancestors who enjoyed really sitting on eggs had uh, chicklet, little, little chicks that developed better than hens who hated sitting on eggs. What is it like when you're in that middle ground then where it's like on one hand, you're a human who's gonna have these unconscious forces playing out in your own lives. But then on the other hand, you're an expert on it, on the science of it. So it's source forces that conscious awareness onto your own like are you constantly psychoanalyzing yourself from or trying to think of the evolutionary motives behind your own behavior <laughs> uh it's a good question it's a question i get asked a lot especially sorry i have dogs <laughs> fighting in the background too by the way um uh, uh it's a question i get asked a lot and i you know i it's never something that's bothered me i guess i'm good at compartmentalizing uh i mean i think there was one time i think once upon a time i saw like steve picker asked a similar question and he said <laughs> something like you know, I'm an enough of an expert to know that I couldn't possibly think through these things on my own. And I think that's kind of been my attitude too. Like these things are just so complicated. There's so many different systems that are pulling in so many different directions. I think like even if I wanted to sit down and game out my life based on my expert knowledge, I think I would completely fail. So sort of just like in my personal life, just, you know, sit back and, and uh, let nature take the reins. Did you come from a evolution background and then later got interested in mating psychology or was it the other way around um so it was i my i was not originally interested in psychology at all um i you know was always more interested in biology as like a youth um my introduction to psychology itself was through evolutionary psychology so learning about evolutionary psychology is what got me into psychology and um and that's think, relatively new, and it started in your department only like 30 years ago, right? Exactly, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, it depends on who you ask, it depends on what you count, but we will gladly take uh, all the credit for inventing evolutionary psychology. No, yeah, I mean, there was, there was a group of, you know, maybe six to eight people uh, who were really responsible for sort of capital E, capital P evolutionary psychology as we understand it today, and John T.B. and Lita Cosmides in our department are... Uh, pretty central figures in that, but so is David Buss, my advisor at uh, UT Austin, and Steve Pinker was there, um, who you share a department with. So, um, you know, there's several players here. Um, but yeah, it, it was it was that that got me into psychology, and then human mating sort of came along with that. I mean, uh, I think it, I was biased because I was introduced to evolutionary psychology by somebody who was interested in mating. <laughs> Uh, but I also think it's a very natural place to start if you're thinking about human behavior from an evolutionary perspective. You know, what is closer to reproductive success than mate choice? Uh, so that was a, a natural topic to fall into. It, it, it seems like when people talk about evolution, they're normally focused on survival of the fittest and not like the survival and successful reproduction of the fittest. Like, Because I, I, 
I don't know at what point in early education we learn about evolution, but I didn't learn about sexual selection until much later in college. Um, maybe we could we could talk about that and overview how that how those two different forces can can lead to different uh, evolutionary pressures. Yeah, no, it's a it's a it's a great point, and it's something. Yeah, when I when I teach evolutionary theory in my class, uh, I I make exactly that point to you, right? That uh, when people a lot of people first learn about evolution, and when a lot of people think about evolution, they think exclusively about natural selection, which is you know differential reproductive success based on survival, right? Things that survive reproduce, things that don't survive don't reproduce, and so there's selection pressures in favor of things that enhance survival. I mean, that's definitely true. But survival only gets you so far, right? It, it doesn't matter if you live for a million years if you never reproduce in the eyes of selection, uh, because all selection is is differential reproduction of genes, right? Some genes make more copies of themselves, they become more numerous and they persist. Some genes make less copies of themselves, they become less numerous and eventually stop existing. And so mm -hmm. what's really even closer to uh, uh, what the genes are most concerned about, at least, is reproduction. And what's really close to reproduction is mating, right? So. Uh, yes, you have to survive. That's important, but you also need success in mating. And so any adaptations that give you greater mating success are also going to tend to increase in frequency over time. And that's the other half of Darwin's theory, sexual selection. Is this where the computational element starts to come in? Because there can be many different mating strategies. Like one strategy could be like, I'm going to just try and sleep with as many other people as possible. <laughs> and then even if it's like a very low chance of success, then the the numbers work out versus like I'm going to invest heavily into one person and like try and start a family with them and make it very stable. Uh, well, the computational element it, it, uh, that can be part of it. There, there's like, two ways that I see the computational part uh, as really being important. And I mean, it, you know, to indulge a little too much personal history. Um, wow, the dogs are really in a mood today. Um, uh, so I, you know, the computational element came into my work. There's a class I took in undergrad by a guy who was a computational neuroscientist, which at the time I didn't even realize was a thing. Um, and he uh, he studied like motor learning in the cerebellum and he was describing his work in class one day and you know, he has like rabbits, I think was his model organism. So he had real rabbits in his lab that he would train on a motor task and then he would observe what, ha what changes happen in their cerebellum. Uh, but then he would also program simulated rabbit cerebella and he would run them through a simulated version of the same task and try to get the simulated cerebella to go uh, to undergo the same changes as did the real rabbit uh, cerebella and his his argument for doing this was well you know if we really understand if i really understand how the cerebellum works then i should be able to build a copy of it and it should work exactly like the real thing and that was the first time i'd heard anyone articulate that idea and i just i remember sitting in that lecture hall and thinking yeah <laughs> that's that's exactly right. That's how we should all be doing our science. <laughs> like, we, you know, we we talk this big talk in psychology about a, a computational model of mind and how, like, we think the brain is a computer and we think all we're studying are the computations it's doing. If we really understand how some bit of psychology works, then we should be able to program a copy of it that does the same thing. But, like, what a how could you have a better test of your knowledge? So I mean, that's really where I see the computational element coming into my work. Like, I, I see my job as emulating the computations the mating psychology is doing and, and trying to get those uh, as close as possible to the real thing. Uh, that said, I, there is a second part of that, which is, yeah, evolutionary theory is complicated. Um, it has a lot of moving parts. And so uh, understanding um, how a given set of circumstances will give rise to a selection pressure and also understanding how a selection pressure will play out and give rise to a set of adaptations it's a complex system and complex systems are often aided by mathematical or computational models. So I think there's a second order benefit, which is uh, the computational approach lets us model selection pressures uh, and evolution much more accurately. And it also lets us model the psychology that evolution creates much more accurately. So I imagine there could be two broad classes of models. So one would be focusing on population level dynamics. So this might make predictions about like if, if there's a different population with a different sex ratio or different environments and so on, how's that going to influence behavior? And then the other one would be modeling the, the behavior of an individual. So like an individual computing their own status or like weighing against different different features and different mates and like trying to computationally pick which one is most optimal. 
Exactly. Yeah. And I mean, there's kind of a third one that bridges the gap a little bit too, which is modeling the behavior of individuals inside populations who have right. to react to one another uh, live and in dynamic ways. And yeah, so like more of my earlier modeling work was kind of that first camp, like trying to model uh, evolution in populations. Uh, and that was useful, but that is very challenging to do. <laughs> Uh, very mm -hmm. challenging to do uh, accurately and informatively. More of my work recently has been closer to the later stuff, like trying to model the behavior of individuals, especially in social contexts, though, and kind of taking the ev evolution stuff for granted. Uh, I'd, I'd like to meet in the middle at some point, uh, modeling the behavior of individuals with some sort of evolutionary component. Uh, getting getting both of those into one model is, is a lot of work. Can we talk through a specific study or a specific result you found from each of those and start with the, the earlier work on, at the more population or theoretical level? Sure, sure. So, I mean, one of my earliest papers, um, especially kind of connected to what I do now, uh, so a really, a question I was interested in I was interested more in earlier in my career. I say earlier in my career as if my career is long, but um, uh, a question I was more interested in once upon a time, still have some interest, but have moved on to other things to some degree, uh, was was basically how do you compute how attracted you are to someone? Um, and more technically, how do you integrate all of your preferences into a value estimate? So, you know, we know from decades of research uh, people have lots of mate preferences, right? You ask a person on the street, what does your ideal partner look like? And they they just, they won't stop talking until you stop them from talking, right? They, they can yeah. list things forever. Um, but, you know, nobody ever finds somebody who has all those things, right? Uh, so all in mate choice, the, the dilemma we always face, right? Is I've got a list of things I want and I've got a partner who has a list of offerings. Those things don't match up perfectly. And so how do I decide, you know, is this a good fit or not? Uh, and so that was the major research question, right? How do I boil down all of those things that I want and all the things that you have into some kind of overall, like, eh, you know, this is a go for me, or this is a no-go, or like, this is a eight for me, or this is a five for me, or, or whatever. Um, so there's, there's lots of algorithms you could imagine for how that might happen. And there's lots of things that people had proposed um, in a not terribly systematic way, right? Like it's, people were just kind of, shooting in the dark and, and not really comparing these things systematically. Um, so, you know, some of them are like, you know, maybe you set like some kind of minimum threshold, right? And you say like for each of those different traits, right? So, you know, you've got to be this attractive before I talk to you and you've got to be like this funny yeah. before I go on a date with you. And you've got to be this kind before I, you know, make this serious, et cetera. That's and this could all be unconscious it. computations going on in the back of our mind, just it in probably every interaction. Is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. It probably is. <laughs> Um, so, you know, that's one way maybe it could happen. You know, uh, one way like a lot of psychologists had proposed is it's just like a really complicated linear regression. So, you know, each of your preferences is like a slope in a, in a, like an equation for a line. And so like, if I say mm -hmm. attractiveness is really important, um, and you say it's not that important, then basically like I'm extra attracted to attractive people, whereas you're kind of only a little bit more attracted to attractive people. Mm -hmm. um, but maybe like you really value kindness and I don't value kindness or something like that. Um, so there's lots of different ways this could happen, uh, but not a lot of systematic evidence for how people actually do it or which of these different ways would actually make more sense in theory. Um, so we tried to address this with the model. So we basically set up a, a big uh, evolutionary <laughs> Uh, it, tournament in a sense, kind of inspired by the the old Axel Rudd uh, cooperation tournaments, um, mm -hmm. where we simulated a population with a bunch of little agents who were trying to select each other as mates, and they all had a set of preferences, and they all had a set of traits, and they all had different algorithms for how they boiled down their preferences into a value estimate and used that to choose each other as partners. Uh, and we just let them choose each other as mates. There were different fitness functions that determined what was uh, uh, the mo the uh, highest fitness partner to choose. Uh, we just saw what uh, attraction algorithms were best at mm -hmm. uh, maximizing reproductive success in this little tournament. Uh, and we reliably saw, uh, at least in the models that we created, that one of the models that worked relatively well was something that was uh, computer attraction as a distance function. 
So uh, uh, basically uh, computed attraction as proportional to a distance between my preferences and your traits through this like abstract reference mm -hmm. space. So I, I can think of two hypotheses that could come out of that. One, one of them would be that you would probably see people with extremely unrealistically high standards relative to their own attractiveness would be selected out and that wouldn't ha sustain itself over time. Um, that's That one seems obvious to me, but then the opposite to that is if you imagine someone evolved with just no standards whatsoever so that they were eligible to mate with everyone, wouldn't that immediately take over? Yeah, uh, great thoughts. Uh, so, I mean, that first one is something we reliably observe over and over again in these evolutionary models. And that's something that you see in real people, and it's also something that you see across species. Uh, so, yeah, you need to have sort of sensible preferences <laughs> if you want to succeed in the mating market. Uh, so this is something that we did not explicitly predict. This is the fun of doing models. Um, but continually observed as we did these evolutionary models where you can start everybody with having sort of uh, arbitrary preferences that have nothing to do with their own characteristics but over time yeah they evolve preferences that are calibrated to their own market value <laughs> so the people that are the most desirable eventually ask for more and the people who are less desirable um kind of are forced to ask for less because the people who are less desirable but have really high standards continually fail to fulfill them. They fail to choose partners and they fail to reproduce. Um, mm -hmm. You know, whether that's how it works in real life um, exactly, like that sort of like, um, is it selection directly that's maintaining uh, these differences in standards? I'm not sure about that, uh, but that is a reliable result for the models. And we do see this, you know, across species there are uh, there's some evidence of assortative preferences, basically, like whatever is desirable for your species. Uh, you know, I, I, I remember seeing um, uh, a paper on this in snakes, right, um, where basically uh, snakes had preferences for partners that were similar in body size to themselves, basically, because larger bodied individuals are more able to compete for larger body partners and smaller bodied individuals get kind of pushed to the periphery and are forced to choose amongst each other. Um, so I think that's a pretty reliable result. And we do see that in human data too, that people who have more of what other people want also ask for more. Um, that said, yeah, would a like low standard <laughs> variant invade a population with well calibrated preferences? Um, I think probably not. I mean. It partly depends on how you think preferences work, uh, but I think regardless of how you think they work, uh, it's always best to ask for the most that you can get, uh, mm -hmm. and probably best to ask for a little bit more than you can realistically get, like overshoot just a little bit, just in case. Because um, if you if you have a lot of market power and you are consistently going for uh, the lowest value options, then uh, you're going to be outcompeted by somebody who has a similar market value, but slightly higher, higher ambitions, right? I, I imagine you would see a sex difference there because you could say that for females where you have like a finite number of pregnancies in a lifespan, then the quality of the genes of your partner really matter because you want to maximize survival and fitness of your offspring. But then for the males, it seems like the, the limiting factor to how many offspring you could leave is just how many partners you could have. So then... Again, at the extreme, you might expect that females would be as picky as they can manage, given given their own uh, their own traits. But then, for males, it's still a bit confusing to me why you wouldn't see some <laughs> some sort of evolution towards the maximally low standards. Like if I if I think about it outside of that computational model, and then in the context of real humans maybe there are some other penalties at play because even if you're high status, if you have low standards and people observe that, that they, they might think something's wrong with you. So there seems to be some penalty at play, but, <laughs> but in a, in a pure model where they don't have like that social bias, I don't know how that would come into play. <laughs> well, so there's two issues there, right? So one is, yeah, I should clarify, like all of our models are looking pretty much exclusively at like long-term committed relationships. Uh -huh. um, so, and in the, the evolutionary model I was talking about just a moment ago, these were like lifelong monogamous pair bonders, not right. like because we were like 
programming anything. Oh yeah, the, if you're stuck the with them for life, certainly the standards are going to be as high as you can manage. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, but if you were talking about like uncommitted short-term relationships where you could have potentially multiple partners across your lifespan, yeah, then things are different, right? Then probably uh, uh, if um, if the number of partners you have is less constrained and if having stricter preferences decreases your rate of reproduction, then yeah, you would probably predict that uh, the more partners you can have would lead to lower standards for each of those partners. And that's that's a long-standing prediction in evolutionary psychology. Like if you think about, it, it's not just a sex difference, it's a sex difference by mating, uh, mating strategy cross. So in long-term mating, where both males and females are dedicating huge amounts of resources to a small number of partners, yeah, everybody should be picky and everybody is picky. Uh, but in short-term mating, where you're dedicating very little resources to potentially multiple partners, yeah, we do see there is empirical data that suggests, although this hasn't been replicated to my knowledge in a long time, at least not explicitly, uh, but there is empirical data that suggests, yeah, men are less picky when it comes to short-term mating than women are, uh, which does align with, yeah, like it, it's a lower cost option for you, so you should just maximize your opportunities and and be less best, less selective about each one. To my knowledge, though, that's like a long-standing prediction, which does line up with non-human animal work. But I don't think that prediction's actually been formalized. Like, have you, have you seen is... any of the dating app data, like from Tinder? Yeah, 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 yeah. And I know, uh -huh. yeah, like uh, you regularly see uh, uh, women in those apps uh, setting much higher standards than men. Although that's kind of confounded with uh, sex ratio in the case of mm -hmm. many of those apps, right? Where uh it, generally women are greatly outnumbered by men which also there's evidence uh, affects standards too so uh -huh. it, it's so probably as a the sex ratio skews the, the the sex that is smaller represented is always going to be seen as more desirable and then that, that effect gets larger the more skewed it is i don't know if they're necessarily seen as more desirable but they because they're scarcer, they have more market power. And so they can afford to set higher demands and they do. Uh-huh. I've, I've heard theories about that what you see in on modern college campuses, like the trend towards hookup culture, part of it could just be changing cultural norms, but part of it also might be the changing sex ratio because now more women are enrolled in college than men. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, there is evidence from like people like Dave Schmidt that, yeah, the sex ratio does affect... Uh, women's interest in short-term mating, at least. Uh, so it could be part of both is what's going on. I mean, I would guess changing cultural norms is the bigger factor there, although why are the cultural norms changing? Um, it, that's a question, a separate question. But yeah, I, I'm sure the the bias, the sex ratio bias is contributing as well. So then at, at the two extremes, and, and these are sort of just like caricatures, but if there's a bunch more women than men, then each man might have the opportunity to juggle multiple partners and you get something that looks like a hookup culture. And then if it's the opposite, if there are too few women, then you might have like the chivalrous uh, different men fighting over women and trying to like outcompete each other and maybe doing that through fighting or doing that like through just trying to be extra nice to the woman and giving gifts <laughs> and so on. And th that that's a whole evolutionary theory itself, right? Because if there's going to be competition, usually male-male competition, one way of getting around that is like to just fight amongst the males and, and beat off all the rivals. But then the other one is just to not do any fighting whatsoever, but to make yourself stand out. Yeah, exactly. And those are the two components of sexual selection, right? So there's intersexual selection. You can uh, succeed in sexual selection by being especially attractive to your potential mates, or you can succeed by intersexual competition, right? You can uh, succeed in mate choice by physically preventing <laughs> all of your rivals from having any mating opportunities. And you know, different species uh, uh, tend to be <laughs> more or less subject to uh, uh, the two different types of selection. So, I mean, that's mm -hmm. why you see the evolution of weaponry in in uh, you know species like deer and also like uh, gorillas and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you get these these really counterintuitive effects, these handicapping effects, like with peacocks. So the biggest, mo brightest peacocks are the most fit, but at the same time, the ones with the biggest feathers are like wasting a bunch of energy, developing big feathers, and it hinders mobility, and it probably makes them more visible to predators. So like outside of sexual selection, you would look at that and think, 
that that's the one most likely to get eaten and die and not leave to their uh, their genes. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so costly signals, right? Mm -hmm. uh, signals that are uh, informative exactly because, um, well, it, they impose a cost on dishonest signalers, right? And so, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, you get these extravagantly wasteful signals um, that exist purely because seemingly they uh, uh, signal your ability to pay costs. Um, and there's also like, you know, Fisherian runaways are another um, uh, preferences, the existence of a preference can cause this runaway selection process uh, where the preference is selecting for a more extreme version of itself, essentially. Um, and that can huh. lead to elaboration of traits like the peacock's tail. Right. It sounds like what I, what I was hinting at there with the idea of like standards lowering over time in this model, that would have been a runaway feedback loop. What is it that usually like stops those? Because if something is adaptive, you might expect everything to run away like you know if, if women like bigger stronger men then we're going to evolve to be bigger and stronger over time and it seems like that's happened to some degree because there's sexual dimorphism but it's not like you know we were we were four feet tall a few thousand a few million years ago and well now we are much taller but it, it's like <laughs> it's not running away till you're getting eight foot humans everywhere there seems to be some sort of natural limit to it right True. Well, I mean, if anything, we're less dimorphic, right? The the history uh, in our species has been uh, decreasing dimorphism over time. Really? Uh, yeah, yeah. So we're, you know. Oh, you mean like I mean, compared at... to chimps who are. Exactly. Then, yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, look at us compared to our great ape cousins, right? Like we are a much more monomorphic species. Like males and females are much more similar in our species than they are in chimps or certainly like gorillas. That was probably due to our history of pair bonding, right? Because uh, pair bonding species tend to have smaller sex differences. Uh, so if anything, we're, we're going the opposite direction. Uh, but I mean, like with all things, you know, life is all about trade-offs, right? So uh, being bigger and stronger, uh, you know, if there is a preference for size and strength, then yeah, that being bigger and stronger will provide you some amount of benefit in terms of uh, uh, intersexual selection, right? It'll give you some sexually selective benefit. But being big and strong is costly, right? Like muscle tissue is energetically expensive. Uh, testosterone is energetically expensive. Um, so if it's decreasing, if it's increasing your energy budget or if it's increasing the costs on your energy budget, if it's decreasing your mobility, if it's taxing your immune system, right? It's going to lead to a survival decrease, which can maybe be tolerated to some degree if it's being compensated by a mating increase. But eventually you're going to reach an equilibrium where having extra size and strength isn't worth the survivability costs that come along with it. And Are you familiar you know, with Jeffrey Miller's mating mind hypothesis? <laughs> uh, yeah, a little bit, yeah. So from, from what I understand, the idea there is like, we evolved bigger brains over time, but our ancestors a few million years ago, and even modern chimps now were surviving well enough with the, the brain sizes that they had before. So it doesn't seem like we bigger brains for better survival chance was like the sole explanation for it. And then he's, he's arguing that it was this sexual runaway feedback loop where like, maybe you're more attracted to a more intelligent partner. And then they're more attracted to a more intelligent partner. And then like over time, all the generations, humans just get smarter and smarter. I think, I think it's creative. <laughs> I think it's, it's fun to think about. It's uh, you know, good outside the box thinking, but you know, if I had to bet my money on it, I, yeah, I would say implausible. <laughs> I mean, you know, uh, sure. Chimps survive enough. Okay. But I mean, just look at us. <laughs> like, yeah. We live in the entire like we've colonized all of the habitable uh, territories on the earth plus Canada, right? Like the, <laughs> the, the, the benefits of intelligence, I think are pretty obvious <laughs> just looking at our species. So I, I think it, it's probably, it seems much more likely uh -huh. to me that, that natural selection is responsible for our intelligence over sexual selection, but you know, uh, that's not to say intelligence is irrelevant in the mating domain. Right. But it, it sort of halts at a point, right? Because we're, we're probably no longer being selected for intelligence and like growing more, evolving more intelligent over time, right? Like it, you, you might even argue, again, like putting aside the, the computational advancements, because maybe we're going to get like a Neuralink thing that makes us way smarter. <laughs> um, but aside from that, if anything, you might say we're, we're devolving because now like thanks to medicine and stuff, it's more common that even if you have like a genetic disorder, 
you can still survive and then pass your offspring or pass that genetic disorder to your offspring. I mean, I wouldn't want to say devolving. I mean, I think, you know, selection pressures change, right? And uh, so I think we're subject to a different set of selection pressures than our ancestors, where, yeah, medicine relieves us of a lot of selection pressures related to, like, health and uh, uh, pathogens and injury and that sort of thing. Uh, and so uh, uh, we're surviving a lot more because of that. But now there's probably selection pressures that we don't even know about that relate to you know, success in this modern and modern life that we're creating. And it, like, that's a normal thing, right? Like all species influence their environment and we influence the environment, you change the selection pressures you're subject to. We just, yeah, probably influence our environment more than most species do. Can you speculate about some of those more modern selection pressures that you, you said we might not even know about, or maybe some that you've done research on already that Oh. <laughs> other people wouldn't have heard of or wouldn't have thought I mean, of it's a good question and i like it's a really hard question so i mean this is not something that we study at all like we're we modern selection is is like uh totally off the table for us there are people who are more interested in those sorts of things but um our lab is like exclusively focused on like what are the universals that we all share now because of our mm -hmm. history of selection rather than where selection is potentially taking us now and i think that's that's really really hard to know um especially uh, the rate at which uh, culture and technology change now, right? Uh, the kinds of things that are invariant enough to pose like long-term selection pressures are probably pretty abstract. I mean, things that like we don't even think about, right? So like everybody's worried about, you know, dating apps changing uh, mating culture, but dating apps have existed for like, what, 20 years? Uh, they didn't, I mean, they were, they were like prototype versions of them before, but they worked totally differently and they're probably not going to exist in 20 years, right? Yeah. 20 years from now, we'll all have like neural implants that just like connect us with our ideal mate across the world or something like that. So like so many of these like highly impactful mm -hmm. cultural and technological events are super ephemeral because these things change so quickly. And so uh, like the kinds of selection pressures we're subject to now are probably like second order things that like none of us is even aware of, like like being able to adapt to like the course of technological changes or something like that. And there's there's even the, the up and coming AI romantic partners, mm -hmm. like uh, th this is going off the deep end uh, <laughs> way away from your research. So if you want, if you want to uh, reel it back in, we can, but th like, there's this one app called Replica, which is kind of like a Chat GPT three GPT three thing, but not as good because it it like it, I've spoken to it and it it sounds really robotic, but yeah. nevertheless they uh, <laughs> they have like the base one which you can talk to for free and it's just a chat bot, and then they have like a subscription version where you can turn it into a romantic partner and people pay <laughs> money for it and get really invested in it and this yeah. is only like the first generation of that so imagine you know with it with another few years or decades of development of this ai plus like adding virtual reality on top of that you could have a whole like black mirror fake girlfriend or boyfriend yeah yeah no i i think that is probably within our near future right and, and i think it's uh you know telling how quickly with any new technological invention uh, we immediately start applying it to romance. Yeah, <laughs> uh, I think that says something about the the place of mating in human life. So I guess all of this could there's you could you could interpret as <clears throat> technology exploiting vulnerabilities or or th things that we evolved for, right? Like another example is diet. Like we we love sugary junk food, um, and we evolved in a time where sugar was like this rare, precious, high energy resource. And now it's just super abundant. So our taste for it is actually bad. But when we evolved it, the taste for it was like an adaptive thing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, uh, uh, auditory cheesecake, <laughs> um, uh -huh. uh, a sort of version of that hypothesis. Um, I, yeah, I mean, I, I think like bad is a word we have to be careful with, right? Like uh bad with respect to what so i think in the case of yeah like our diet uh our preference for sugary things probably causes negative health health outcomes um whether or not that's like fitness promoting is a separate question 
Uh, so there's, you know, what's promoting of fitness, there's what's promoting of health, and then there's just like what's promoting of like happiness and well-being. And yeah. those are three separate things which are never necessarily associated with one another, right? Well, health and mm -hmm. well-being are probably associated with one another, but, you know, fitness and uh, uh, happiness are not necessarily the same thing. So there might mm -hmm. be, you know, yeah, an AI girlfriend, you're not going to reproduce with her, but, you know, she might make you happy, right? She might make uh -huh. your life more meaningful. Uh, I don't know. I I imagine that won't be true. I would hope that won't be true for a while. But, but then um, would the roundabout explanation would be like, she makes you happy because she's tricking your brain, which evolved to be happy at like having a real romantic partner into thinking that she's a real romantic partner? Tricking. I mean, we're all just tricking one another all the time in a sense, right? Like, you know, Dawkins you know, famously said all communication is exploitation, basically. So, you know, like your real partner is making you happy just because they're, you know, tricking your brain into thinking it's getting the things that it wants to have. Uh, so uh, I think like uh, uh, if people are happy, then that's what counts. Um, yeah. So to dial it back to your own research, we talked about one of your uh, computational models, which was more like a population-based thing. And then you mentioned more recently, you've been doing work more individual focused. Yeah, yeah. Well, so it's funny you mentioned Black Mirror. Um, yeah. So uh, there's there's a Black Mirror episode, uh, uh, Hang the DJ, I think, uh, uh -huh. which if you haven't seen it by now, spoilers, but um, it's like 10 years old at this point. So I don't feel that bad. Uh, but I, I was like giving this talk over and over again about this like new line of research we were doing. And every time I gave the talk, people would come up to me afterwards and like, have you seen the Black Mirror episode, Hang the DJ? And I was like, no, no, I haven't yet. I've been too busy. Uh, but it like kept coming up. And then like, I finally watched after like the third time this happened, I finally watched it. And I was like, damn it, they scooped me. Um, <laughs> but it, it, you know, if you've seen that episode, the, the work that we're doing a lot in the lab is very much like that, where uh, basically uh, what we do is we collect data from real people. Right now we've, we've done it exclusively from people who are already in relationships. Uh, so we collect data from people who are in relationships uh, about things that might have been relevant to their mate choice. So like, what do you prefer in a partner and, and what do you actually like? And then we take that data and use it to make basically a simulated copy of those people. So, you know, if you and I were dating, right, there'd be a simulated Adam in my computer with all of your preferences and characteristics and a simulated Dan in my computer with all of my preferences and characteristics. We do that for a bunch of people who are all in relationships uh, and we can simulate a little mating market with all of those people. Um, and then we run those, we big, break all the couples up so everybody is single. We run all those little simulated copies of people through a mating market with mate choice algorithms that we control experimentally. And then we see, you know, for this mate choice algorithm, how many of those real world couples did it actually successfully reproduce? Huh. Like, did it get you and me back together in a relationship? Uh, the idea being, if we had measured all the correct things and we used the, huh. I mean, going back to the rabbit cerebellum example, right? If we'd measured all the correct things and we used the right mate choice algorithm, then you and I should fall in love again and we should get back together inside the simulation. So, so the you more do this more... in iterated cycles over and over again? Well, we'll do it for a bunch of different algorithms and we'll see, uh -huh. you know, which algorithms do the best at getting people back with their real world partners. Uh -huh. So they really did scoop you because in the Black oh, yeah. Mirror episode, it's not just like a correlation or the percent overlap between the preferences that if they say you're a 99 percent match in, in the show, what that meant is that if they simulated a thousand runs, like in 990 of them, they ended up being partners. Yeah, and we can do exactly the same thing. <laughs> Yeah, That's we can simulate cool. you in, in a bunch of different mating markets and see and how many of those markets do you actually get back together, yeah. And this is what you're actively working on? Yeah, yeah. And so we have a paper that came out 2021 kind of introducing the general method, and then we've got a couple other projects in the works that, that hopefully will be coming out soon that uh, explore sort of testing out different algorithms that work in different ways to see uh, what actually reproduces people's choices the best. Are the algorithms something that would make sense to, to talk about different strategies or would that be too technical? Uh, they can, I, we can talk about them at a high level. Some of them get a little bit technical, but um, you know, so there are a handful of these that existed in the prior literature. Um, one, you know, one that works relatively well, that's relatively well known. Uh, it's called the Gale Shapley algorithm, which uh, comes from economics. It actually won a Nobel prize, if I recall correctly. Um, 
and it's just like a general matching algorithm. It's actually not was not built as a mate choice algorithm. It's just for matching anything that needs to be matched. But it was uh, at least explained with a marriage analogy. Uh, it, it's a, a solution to what economists call the stable marriage problem. Um, so basically, the way it works is you know you have one set of things in a mate choice bottle, right? You have one set of things that are males. You have another set of things that are females. Uh, basically, at each step, every male that doesn't have a partner just approaches his most preferred female. Uh, and then the females will have a list of offers. Each female will just pick the male that she prefers the most, and she'll reject all the other males. And you just cycle that over and over again. So each time step, each male approaches the most preferred female who hasn't rejected him yet, and each female will choose whichever male she likes the most. Uh, and you just keep doing that over and over again, and eventually everybody finds a partner. Uh, and it's it's a nice algorithm because it's guaranteed that everyone finds a partner. It's also guaranteed that all the matches will be stable, meaning no one will prefer enough to be with another partner who would also prefer to be with them in return. Uh, so it's very like tidy, very elegant, um, a very good way to match things that need to be matched. Um, does not turn out to be the best description of human mate choice, though. Uh, that one performs relatively well, but uh, is not generally the best performing algorithm that we have. Um, and, you know, the guarantee that the, the pairs will be stable is probably, that's the one that always jumps out to people as like, well, that would be nice, but real human relationships are not necessarily stable. Are, are the sense. traits that, that these simulated people have stable? Because or because you, you could say that maybe one of the reasons that relationships aren't perfectly stable is because even if it's a perfect match at the start, people change over time. Yeah, so they're not stable. <laughs> they do change over time. And we're generally getting just like, snapshots of what people are like and basing the models on that. Um, we are, so my grad student, uh, Carlos Sosokolindres right now is working on a set of models where, uh, yeah, trying to model how preferences change over time, trying to basically kind of returning to what we were talking about earlier, like how do you calibrate your preferences to your market value? Uh, he's building a model using this uh, couple simulation framework. Uh, he's building a model of how people adjust their preferences over time. So that's definitely something we want to incorporate. Um, and we have some recent longitudinal data so we can like look at people's cha changes in people's preferences and traits over time. So it's definitely part of it, but that's not uh, that's not the whole story because even just within a snapshot, uh, you can see other algorithms do better. Uh, the algorithm that generally works the best uh, is one that we've worked on. Um, we call it the resource allocation model. And without getting too far into the weeds, it's basically a reciprocity model. Um, so, uh, basically everybody starts by pursuing the partner, pursuing partners in proportion to how desirable they are. So they have like a fictional set of resources that they can allocate to their partners and they initially allocate just directly in proportion to value. So the highest value partner gets most of your resources, the lowest value partner gets the least. Uh, and then there's an iterated series after that, where you just continually allocate more resources based on how many resources you were given in the past. So if you showed a lot of interest in me last time, I'll show a little bit more interest in you. If you, if you showed not that much interest in me last time, I'll show a little bit less interest in you. You iterate that for you know a certain amount of time and basically everybody converges on one partner that is both desirable to them, but also who has strong mutual interest in them. And, and that you mentioned that really you're comparing well. the different algorithms to actual human behavior. What is the actual human behavior of a resource allocation in this case? So we tend to think of it as like, you know, everybody has a limited budget of uh -huh. uh, resources that you can dedicate to mate pursuit, right? So it's things like time that you only have so many, so much time in the day that you can dedicate to like talking to people, going out with people, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, some of it's energy, right? Like doing that stuff burns calories and you only have so many calories, especially if you're thinking, um, you know, ancestral mate choice. Some of that's, uh -huh. you know, money or other physical resources that you're dedicating to that relationship, right? It's all uh -huh. of your mating effort, right? It's just all the like expendable stuff that you are spending pursuing a partner. Do we have a good sense already of how much mating effort people are already giving? No. So yeah. So right now, like, uh, as a simplification, right? The model just assumes everybody has the same budget and you just allocate your budget across your options. But yeah, that's definitely not true, right? Some people have bigger budgets than other people do. Uh, and so how do you estimate what that is and how do you build that into the models? That's a, that's a question that's been on our minds. So I guess with, with modeling, a, uh, an oversimplification is some types try to 
mimic human behavior as accurately as possible with the goal of understanding the mechanism of the human behavior. And then others where it's like, maybe you already know the mechanism, but you don't know the actual behavior. So then this would be more like that, where we're aiming to see, make predictions about how much uh, resources humans might actually allocate. And then maybe you could go test that in the real world. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I, I think in this case, we are trying to understand what the mechanisms are. Uh, uh -huh. But yeah, as we get better purchase on what those are, then we can turn to a more predictive mode where we can say, okay, like, this is a free parameter. The amount of resources you have in the model is a free parameter. And we'll just like mathematically determine, like, what's the best estimate of the amount of resources you have. And then we can see, does that map on to, you know, something about your personal life that we can say yeah. is like, ah, look, here's, here's the resources we were estimating in the model. In actual human brains, how much of this do you think depends on theory of mind or the the ability to think about what other people are thinking, presumably that's thinking about you? That's a great question. I think a lot of it, right? I think theory of mind uh, uh, saturates the whole system, right? Uh -huh. Because, I mean, in order to choose a good partner, and I, I think this is something that has been missing from the mating literature as a whole, and I think this is part of why the these computational models are so useful. Because, um, yeah, so much mating research historically is, like, you sitting at a computer and, like, choosing mates basically off of a menu, right? Like, mm -hmm. here's partner one. Like, do you want to pursue them? Yes or no. Here's partner two. And you don't really have to consider how that person might react to you. But that's integral mm -hmm. to mate choice, right? <laughs> like, you have to choose a good partner, but also they have to choose you back. So you need to be able to think strategically about, like, what's the likelihood that this person would be interested in me? What kinds of things can I do that might make that person interested in me? And so you need to have some kind of representation mm -hmm. of what the mating market looks like from their perspective, right? What are their yeah. preferences? What are their strategic interests? And you need to be able to adjust your behavior in response to that. So I think, yeah, theory of mind is extremely important to human mating. Absolutely. You mentioned Steve Pinker a few times, and we've been doing uh, some research on this phenomenon of common knowledge, which is mm -hmm. kind of related. So theory of mind or shared knowledge has like different levels. So like level one is I'm thinking about what you're thinking. Level two is I'm thinking about what you're thinking about what I'm thinking. And you can like go on like ad infinitum. And then common knowledge is kind of just like, it's out there. So you can do as many iterations as you want. And I'm wondering if that might also uniquely influence mating psychology, because you could imagine something like a, a social pressure as well. So the classic Solomon and Ash experiment, for example, where it's like you you ask two people which line is longer, and one is literally longer, but all of the others say that the shorter line is longer, and you mm -hmm. see a, a, a pretty significant proportion of people give in to peer pressure, and they're thinking maybe I'm just seeing it wrong if all these people think that the short one is actually longer, so they change their answer, and I'm wondering, like, which which one matters more for mating preferences? Because you could say like you think someone's really attractive but then everyone else is saying they're not, does it cause you to second guess your own belief or, or the other way around? Like you think they're not, but everyone else does. Do you then give in to the, the peer, uh, not, not exactly peer pressure, but like the, co the collective consensus on what, what the attractiveness level is? Yeah, it's a great question. And I, I don't know. Um, I mean, so I've been working on a project forever now. I'm writing the paper now. I really want to be done with this project very soon. So hopefully I'll have a finished manuscript soon and I can just move on with my life. But I, I mean, the, the core of the project is an idea that I'm still fond of, which is we tend to take for granted in mating research that people know what their partners are like, uh, but we know that's not true, right? And, you know, mm -hmm. I think Peter Todd Peter Todd does a lot of credit in mating research, but like he he and Jeffrey Miller sort of put their fingers on this problem a long time ago. Um, but yeah, like you, you have to learn what a partner is like and you don't get that information for free. And also they're incentivized to deceive you, right? Everybody's incentivized to look as good as possible uh, uh, in the mate choice phase at least so that they're more likely to get a partner that's better than, than they otherwise would. And so, you know, all we ever get are sort of noisy snapshots of what a person is like and we have to sort of collect those noisy images over time into some kind of overall, hopefully better representation of what this person is really like. Uh -huh. And uh, we don't really acknowledge that in mate choice research. We don't really study how people do that kind of process. 
but given that each of us, you know, for any given potential mate, each of us only has a sort of noisy representation of what that person is mm -hmm. really like, then it's only rational to include social information, right? Like I have some set of samples of what this person is like. You have a different set of samples of what that person is like. If we average those together, assuming I can trust you to tell me accurately what your representation of them is, which I, I don't know that I necessarily can. Uh -huh. That's another strategic issue here. So there's like, there's uncertainty built in and there's like a Bayesian updating approach of, of what your actual beliefs are. Hmm. Well, <laughs> we test we test a variety of models and the Bayesian one uh, maybe does relatively well. You'll have to read the paper when it comes out. Um, but yeah, I, I look like forward the, to seeing that. <laughs> uh, but so, yeah, I mean, it's a, it, I, in this case, it's not about social information, but I, I do think social information is a big part of that. And there is, there's a phenomenon called mate choice copying, which happens again across species, like from fish to humans, where yeah, somebody else being chosen as a mate makes them more attractive to other potential mates. And I think that is that kind of like social information use, right? Like maybe they know something I don't. Maybe it's maybe it is reasonable to like that person more than I thought they, they uh, more than I thought I did. Yeah, I, I wonder if this could be a modern way of explaining one of Freud's theories. And not not one of his crazy theories. I think that this was onto <laughs> something. So he had this idea of projecting your ideal onto someone. And it's like you fall in love with them, even if it's a complete stranger. So it's it's basically the most extreme version of a crush. And what you could, in a, in a Bayesian framework, you could say you get a little bit of information about them and it's in the positive direction. So it causes you to overestimate how good of a partner you think they are. So you're projecting your ideal onto them that ideal being like all of the set of preferences that you have. And it seems like we've been talking about how everyone might have that implicitly stored in their brain somehow. And then it's like, you find out, and then suddenly you get a new piece of information inconsistent with that ideal and you're disillusioned with them. And the whole thing, so he, he viewed this as like a, a psychopathology type thing, uh, or, or a, I, I don't remember what he called it, but it, it seems rational if you look at it from a Bayesian perspective here. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it, it's it's a good reinforcement learning, right? Like, yeah. you have some number of unknown options, and you don't know which one is the best. You need to be motivated to explore them until you find out which one is the best. And uh -huh. I mean, and yeah, you need a prior that tells you what is your initial belief about how rewarding these things are going to be. And yeah, if you have a, a prior that suggests everybody is super rewarding, you know, a re in reinforcement learning, that would be like an optimistic start. And that motivates you to explore your options enough to find out which one is actually the best. It is very rational. We've covered a lot of territory here, Dan. This was excellent. Thank you very much for your time. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much for having me.